great. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for coming. It's this will be a real. I don't. I don't know if we're going to walk out uh, happier than we entered. We'll probably walk out less happy. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Once once we get into the thick of this, we're all going to be pretty unhappy here about the, the way things are headed. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you, William, for flying across the pond. Thank you, for Melissa, for coming in from across the Hudson. And um, and yeah, thank you all for coming out in the rain. Um, so we're here to talk about happiness. Uh, and we're here to talk about the industrialization of happiness, uh, as the title of the book is, The Happiness Industry. Uh, and so as a way, I guess, of, of, of starting this, uh, Will, to really sort of lay out some of the stakes is, is, I was hoping you could talk a bit about what happiness is. I mean, to industrialize happiness means that we're going to have to have some sort of, of happiness as commodity, some sort of discrete phenomenon. And this to me is interesting, because normally I think when we think of happiness, we think of this emotional state, this conscious, this thing has made me happy, and I can describe happiness and how it feels. And for those of you who haven't read the book, which is I'm sure most people in this room, I, I read it because I'm moderating this event tonight, so I made sure to get an early start, um, is that you know the book touches upon the fact that the happiness has really changed definitions or is changing definitions from something that can be consciously expressed to something that we are extracting out of our data, uh, out of ourselves, something that can be measured in the brains and that can be measured by galvanic skin response, everything else, and then this is leading to a very different state of affairs. So I was hoping you could talk a bit about what is the history of happiness and, and where is the future of happiness? Yeah, um, and the history of this can begin in various points over the last 200 years. And in the book, I cover quite a lot of historical territory from Jeremy Bentham in the late 18th century through the rise of behaviorism in the early 20th century through the early interest in emotions in the human resources uh, movement which begins in the 1930s but I think what you're alluding to here Greg is something which is really dates back to the early 1990s which is a new belief, a new ideal that our emotions are objectively knowable entities which can be quantified, measured and integrated into workplace strategies, into branding strategies, into healthcare strategies in various ways. Now there are various companies, various technologies which allow this objectification of our emotions and our uh, economization, if you like, our, our quantification of our emotions to take place. There are companies which uh, specialize in what's called sentiment analysis, which subject things like tweets or email or text messages to uh, algorithmic analysis to try and identify how much positive emotion is conveyed in a single statement. This allows uh, companies to uh, track the positive and negative emotions that are flowing around Twitter uh, with a view to understanding how brands are uh, affecting people emotionally and that sort of thing. Equally, there are uh, companies uh, which are analysing uh, uh, facial movements with a view to understanding the impact of brands and uh, uh, products on our emotions. Companies such as Affectiva, which is spun out of MIT, which can analyse positive or negative emotion through a, an ordinary computer webcam in terms of how someone's face is moving. Uh, there are fields such as neuroeconomics, which focus on particular chemicals such as dopamine in the brain, with a view to updating many of the core assumptions of neoclassical economics, which date back to the late 19th century, but to uh, combine uh, the field of neoclassical economics with uh, an analysis of, uh, of the brain, with uh, the aspiration to render decision-making in the market something which can actually be understood in terms of uh, the, the flow of different chemicals within the brain. So I think what's happened over the last 20 years is a refreshed uh, 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 idealism, really, that happiness, positive emotion, is something that can be rendered biological, something that can be seen, something that then can be traced and integrated with other forms of management, economics, economic policy, uh, and so on. And the rise of wearable technology, which is in the ascendancy right now is, uh, uh, is, is simply adding to the, uh, to the momentum of that. I think over the much longer period of time, there has always been, and I think Bentham in some ways is the, the architect of this, but it, it arises with things like uh, uh, the, the, the discovery of antidepressants in the 1950s and the various other points, uh, uh, another type of almost kind of utopian ideal that core questions of human flourishing, core questions of human wellness can be rendered 
scientific, can be rendered biological, and the, the questions of who to be, how to live, what kind of person am I, and how can I become better in some fundamental sense, that those questions are amenable to sorts of physiological, medical, biological, uh, or economic answers. And I think that is something which also fuels uh, quite a lot of this today. Again, in things like wearable technology, you can see that sort of thing. Just a quick follow-up question to that. Uh, can you talk a bit about more the sort of political economy of happiness that exists now? One of the things that struck me about happiness as a word is that happiness has become, and, and happiness in its sort of twin wellness is how I think of this now, or how we discuss this now, the discussion about wellness, is that uh, happiness is like innovation in the sense of it is on the surface completely depoliticized. We all want to be happy. Who doesn't want to be happy here? Who doesn't want to come up with new ideas? We can all agree that happiness is an objective goal that we should all strive for. And beneath that, of course, it, it's masking something. What is, it, what is it masking? Well, at the contemporary moment, I think uh, fundamental to all of this is a fear of declining productivity in the workplace. Uh, with the rise of happiness economics in the 1990s and the rise of what has become known as well-being in management over a similar period of time, under, underlying that is uh, an anxiety of uh, stagnation of productivity, stagnation of effort at work. So uh, amongst the more dramatic findings of happiness economics are those that relate specifically to productivity and to effort at work. There is uh, work by uh, the British happiness economist Andrew Oswald, which suggests that a happy worker is 12% more productive than an unhappy worker. Uh, the opinion polling company Gallup uh, have gone from being, so much of their business model traditionally was obviously focused on uh, elections and, and political voting preferences, but increasingly they're focused on well-being and they survey a thousand Americans every single day on the question of how, uh, how of their well-being. Um, and a lot of this data is being collected with a view to anticipating problems of what they call employee engagement. They suggest that uh, only around 20% of the US workforce is what they consider to be engaged in their work. And they have an astonishing calculation that uh, the uh, net cost of employee disengagement to the US economy is $500 billion a year or something, which is uh, quite how you come up with a, a calculation on that scale. That's taking into account productivity, uh, healthcare costs, and all this sort of thing. Um, but this would, in a sense, their idea of what an engaged if 100% of the, the, the labor market was engaged, you'd be looking at a completely different type of society, a completely different model of capitalism. Uh, so a lot of these calculations, a lot of these measures are introduced with a, uh, out of an anxiety that on some level capitalism is unable to command the levels of enthusiasm, the levels of engagement that are required in economies where uh, forms of other types of, of, of managerial control, other forms of behavioral management uh, don't seem able to extract the types of effort, the types of enthusiasm that are important in an economy where care, customer service, ideas, creativity uh, are famously at the core of a post-industrial economy. Uh, the happiness agenda is instrumentalized in the service of that type of economy. Interesting. So, so it's interesting. So you're, so you're, well, as I say, my, my next question is for Melissa here. So Will is describing like the, basically we all need to take Soma so we could work 24 seven. And really, really the perfect drug then is going to be a combination of, of Adderall and Soma. Um, but then, then there's a whole other strain of how happiness has been, if, if this is a discussion of how it's being industrialized, and we've also seen over 100 years how it's been weaponized by the advertising industry, and I think my favorite philosopher of happiness is Don Draper, happiness is the moment before you need more happiness. So Melissa, you've, you've studied and written a length about the advertising industry. How has their conception of, of happiness evolved, and how is it deployed in that? Because we're constantly being told that we're unhappy until we have this thing, and so what is that whole strain of thought? Yeah. Advertising has been so good at understanding how to get us where we live and talk about what it takes to be happy. I mean, advertising figured out years, decades ago that if they could attach the idea of happiness to buying stuff, that then they had it made because we all want to be happy, as you suggested. So if we would only buy whatever product is out there, then we would become happy. Uh, but what advertising also realized is that the circuit couldn't end there, right? You couldn't just say, okay, buy this product and now you're happy. You had to create this sense of ongoing desire, so you had to make someone feel like once they bought that product, they were then still somewhat unhappy. They were still somehow unfulfilled. Um, so really what 
advertising figured out was that the ongoing sense of happiness uh, would be better connected to a sense for desire that was never actually fulfilled. Um, you know, a lot of people have written about this, certainly not something that, that I invented, you know, but this, having that, that um, psychological attachment to things um, as making us happy was something that advertising worked on uh, for a long time. Uh, now it seems like because some of the things that uh, Will talks about in, in his book, um, advertising has figured out ever more sophisticated ways of trying to connect us to happiness. One of the things uh, Will talks about is neuromarketing. For instance, so the idea here is that you can look inside the brain, see where the happiness or pleasure centers are inside the brain, and then um, you know, once you've pinpointed that, you can figure out what people need, and then you can target ads specifically to them. So the idea now is that, okay, I can't just come up with an ad uh, that everyone is going to respond to, because what makes me happy might not be the same thing that makes you happy. So what I really need to do is figure out what makes you tick, figure out what makes everyone in the room tick, and then come up with individualized, personalized ads to reach each and every one of us. So, you know, so I, I mean, I could go on, yeah, right? Yeah. So then you could look at how uh, social media and marketing have become so closely intertwined. In fact, I'm, I'm convinced that social media serves the advertising industry more than it serves any of us. Right? So you use social media now to promote the idea of happiness uh, because people want to feel connected. They want to feel a sense of community. They want to feel like they uh, have someone that they can relate to. They want to feel like there's loyalty. And advertising, again, has gotten so good at inserting itself into those connections, those friendships uh, that need to relate, and then marketing to us through those friendships and connections. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, here's a question for either of you then. I mean, in, you know, how should we be happy? I guess, in a sense. Well, you, I mean, you touch, you touch into this. There's a passage in here, I won't quote it verbatim, but there's a passage I really like, which is, you know, to me, the, the, the crux of the book, which is arguing that, that happiness has become something uh, that is a, is, a, is a phenomenon, is a concrete physical phenomenon that we treat, that is a symptom, that is a coping mechanism. It's either pharmacology or it's, uh, it's, something, it's something that's being administered to us, it's treated, versus emergent from a set of conditions. So my question is, you know, if you were to redesign a saner world, what would be the political economy of that world? What would be the, the social conditions? What does what does real happiness look like in the twenty first century? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, let me Academics, go here. I think there 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 are, there are a couple of couple of things here. I think one of the curious things about happiness economics and happiness statistics, the first attempt to try and measure the happiness of entire nations begins in the mid nineteen sixties. So this is the time of the rise of humanistic psychology. It's also the time when positive psychology comes along. Psychologists and psychiatrists and psychoanalysts had barely thought to study happiness until this point. The question of what is happiness as a scientific question, it's relatively recent, at least as, a, as an object of study within the, the psychological sciences. Um, and it arises at that moment, partly as a countercultural and critical response to a seemingly commercialized, corporatized, you know, the, the world of the organization man, the, you know, the, the, this was a, it begins as a countercultural reaction against conformity, against markets, against capitalism. Uh, and what is, then becomes the social indicators movement, as it's often known, is an effort to try and come up with measures of well-being which uh, are not reducible to money. Now, this is something which I think, in, in, in a setting such as this, is something which I think we, you know, many of us here would uh, support, feel enthusiastic about. What I think is so troubling about the agenda, and in some ways quite tragic, is how that identical critical apparatus becomes almost kind of inverted so that instead of asking the question what in society, what within capitalism are the conditions for human flourishing, becomes a body of evidence, a technical form of measurement, ultimately a form of surveillance, not in a sort of big brother kind of Orwellian sense, but in the sense of more and more and more of our lives being audited, be it right up to the current day of jawbone and Fitbit wearables and that sort of thing but not with a view to changing society, but with a view to changing us. So what begins as quite an idealistic moment of asking what would the economy look like in order for human flourishing to be possible, morphs by the 1990s into a question of how should humans behave, how should they 
alter their cognitive apparatus, cognitive behavioral therapy, self-help, um, this sort of thing, so that we can change ourselves so as to cope with a world that seems beyond change. So that as capitalism becomes seemingly beyond the limits of democratic uh, control, beyond the limits of political transformation, which is in some ways what the concept of neoliberalism alludes to, so the question of transformation becomes thrust back upon the individual and taken away from society. And I think that's what happens to this science and study of happiness between the moment of around about 1965 when they first try and do sort of happiness statistics at the level of nations through to uh, the time when official statistical agencies, now the British Office of National Statistics, proudly collects data on well-being and this sort of thing, appeals to a sort of countercultural language. Our Prime Minister is very proud of the fact that we collect data on subjective well-being in Britain now. But ultimately, how does that then cash out as a policy intervention? Well, it cashes out in terms of enforced cognitive behavioural therapy for the unemployed, in job centres, what is called behavioural activation in job centres, what uh, amounts to things like uh, making uh, behavioural, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy programmes and that sort of thing a necessary condition of receiving disability benefits and this sort of thing. So you are now actually punished if you refuse some of these treatments, uh, to, put it, to put it bluntly. Be happy or else, damn it. I mean, that's essentially what it amounts to. Uh, I'm not sure I answered your question about uh, what should happiness look like, but I think a society in which that original ideal was still alive would be a society that I want to live in. Uh, and I mean, there was one, it's a slight drop in the ocean, but there was um, a CEO in, the, in, in America recently, I now can't remember the company, but who read the data on happiness economics and cut his salary from over a million dollars a year to something like $75,000 a year or something because he uh, discovered from reading a body of happiness economics that this would not only improve the productivity within his company because of the, the negative effects of inequality on well-being and the negative effects of well-being on productivity, but also he discovered from this body of evidence that uh, his own well-being was not going to be any higher earning a you know, million dollars a year than earning 75000 Now. You know, in is a way, that the exception which proves the rule. I mean, <laughs> I was just going to say, is that a bad thing? That act into itself? I don't, I don't clearly. I mean, there's nothing to criticise about that. It's just no. that uh, if that's what we're 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 holding out hope for, then we we've got a long uh, road of road progress ahead of us. <laughs> well, I, I want to answer your question please. by asking another question, please. which is, what's wrong with being sad some of the time? I mean, right, some of the greatest works of art were created by really sad people. <laughs> I mean, I think Louis C.K., the comedian, has a, just a fantastic take on this. He has this, this bit where he talks about how he, you know, he feels a moment of sadness, and then he has to tweet a whole bunch of people and say, I feel sad. And then all these people tweet back and make him feel better about himself. But he can't just sit there quietly and just be sad for a minute. So I, I mean, that doesn't answer your question either. What does it take to be happy? But just to, it seems as though some of what Will is talking about is almost not allowing us to feel what we're really feeling, but rather trying to suppress certain kinds of feelings in favor of others that lead to us being more productive or um, more, you know, better, higher in the rankings of national productivity. Well, that's, I would say, I would, I would say by now, everyone, you should be hearing the lyrics to Radiohead's "Fitter Happier" in the back of your mind. It's like keep thinking of "Fitter Happier Better." Um, Melissa, I, I wanted to touch upon a, a point that he brought up with the national indicators, because this is, so I would say this is my one chance to plug her book, Branding Nations, Melissa's book, where she really looked at the rise of particularly the, no, the notion of, of, corp, of, of national competitiveness and, you know, all those livability studies that show, you know, this is the best nation for so-and-so and these are the best cities. Melissa's did a whole analysis of this. And I would love you, because really what you're describing there is sort of at the beginnings of the gamification of happiness. And so I was hoping you could talk a bit about that, about like at the national level, policy changes designed to gamify, to, 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 to basically hack the ranking systems to make it look like they're getting happier because now we're seeing this trickle down to the personal, essentially. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, like Will said, this starts in the 50s and 60s, but what starts to really happen, what I try to talk about in that book is a whole industry of branding consultants who used to work on products, making people happy through products, who now realize that you know, they have 180 new clients, which are countries. They can go in and uh, work with these countries to uh, assess what it is exactly this country represents to the world. And that to the world is a really key piece of it because what that suggests is that it's not so much about how happy the country is inside the country, it's how much other people in other countries think that country is happy. That's really key. 
because one of the real goals of something like nation branding is to attract people from outside, whether that's for tourism, uh, whether that's foreign direct investment, you know, get companies to locate their headquarters in your country and then bring skilled workers in uh, and so on. Whether that's for uh, getting international sporting events like the Olympics or the World Cup to your country. So a lot of those decisions get made on the basis of how well off and how much well-being there seems to be, how much harmony there seems to be in the country. So what branding consultants did uh, was really quite ingenious. They both created the way to measure that happiness, and then they used those measurements of, as symptoms of their effectiveness. Right? So it was this kind of closed chamber of analysis where they could say, OK, we're going to help this country rise in the rankings that we have just created of uh, national uh, happiness. And if the country moves from 20 to 10, well, that's a media story. So then we're going to send that story around internationally, talk about how this country has risen in the rankings. And I mean, the sad thing about this, I, I was very critical about this phenomenon in the, in the book, because what so often ended up happening was not actual measures to improve the well-being of citizens, but really either it was the development of infrastructure to attract more tourists, which has some advantages, but has a lot of negative features too, because it takes money away from other maybe more pressing concerns. Um, but it also meant that um, certain kinds of policies could then get enforced, which uh, really didn't benefit the society. Uh, and instead, what you saw, I think Will talked about this in his book, is things like um, friendliness training, where you would have citizens, especially people like people in the tourism industry, like hotel workers and taxi drivers, having to undergo training to act a certain way when people came. So it's this whole, I mean, it's just these sort of very bizarre kinds of, again, productivity initiatives that were taking place. Um, at the same time, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other, I mean, there were just so many features of this um, nation branding. Uh, using, again, social media, using citizens as kinds of brand ambassadors to talk about how great their country was to others. Um, not, again, not that there's anything wrong with doing that, but it was all in the service of kind of making money and being competitive, not in the service of actually making people really feel better about where they were or doing anything to really change their living conditions. Well, it's interesting to me is that a lot of this, a lot of these efforts, techniques at the, you know, either the corporate branding level, the nation branding level, and policy discussion, at the individual, at the psychopharmacology level, um, has led to these crazy cognitive distances. So my favorite, you know, at the, at the national level is, I mean, uh, I'm sure many of you may have heard of the gross, uh, gross happiness product, gross domestic happiness, which was a measure created by Bhutan. Well, what no one ever tells you about that is that Bhutan actually practiced ethnic cleansing, not genocide, but like literally forced expulsion, resettlement, denial of citizenship, to purge unhappy elements out of their society, which allowed them to actually create this metric. Um, it's the original sin at the root of gross domestic happiness. And Will, we were, we were discussing beforehand, uh, Will, I'd love you to tell the story about the call you got in London from a person in Dubai, where Dubai is engaging in its own pro uh, program to basically have citizens self-report happiness so they can help improve the Emirate. And this is, of course, leading to perverse consequences. Yeah, well, this, so. this was a slightly unexpected phone call I had only a couple of days ago in London. Someone from uh, the Dubai e-government team had seen that I had a book out on happiness. I'd probably slightly misunderstood what kind of <laughs> argument I was making in the book about happiness, but um, Dubai has set itself a pledge of becoming the happiest city in the world. And uh, they have set up these interfaces all over the city of Dubai uh, where you can press a button to say how you're feeling. And there's a smiley face, a neutral face, and an unsmiley face. Um, and the idea is that they will get constant feedback on the emotional effects of various public services, infrastructure, amenities, and so on. And the phone call I had, actually, was that the guy was in London at the time uh, and told me, this is what he said, I don't know if he was, thought he was under surveillance or something, but he said, I wouldn't want to tell you this, I want to tell you this now while I'm in Dubai, but just so you know, uh, there is no intention, actually, of... Of, of these statistics coming out with any other result other than maximum happiness because we're in a contest against Singapore as a sort of uh, international competitiveness of Dubai versus Singapore. And he said he'd struggled quite hard to get the unhappy face into the interface because there just wasn't any interest in, in knowing about unhappiness. So this actually isn't really, you know, this is a sort of almost like a bogus example of, of, of where this goes. But I think that, if anything, that speaks of how well-being and happiness have become... Um, They've certainly got a, a kind of uh, flavor of the month element to them in the, in, in the policy world. Um, and with the rise of wearables and the rise of 
what's called affective computing, which I was kind of alluding to earlier with sentiment analysis, facial scanning, uh, what's called people analytics in the workplace, the idea that uh, the science of well-being can be the answer to nearly any form of social, economic, or political problem, it's clearly kind of getting out of hand. Uh, and in some of the excesses, there will be clearly governments that simply want more and more and more evidence of, of positivity, even when it sort of takes leave of, of reality, even. But, um, yeah. yeah. Well, I was thinking of this, well, Melissa, you also mentioned earlier, we were discussing this. I mean, if, that's, if, if Dubai is the example of that at the high end, and I mean, I think the reality of a lot of social media is the example of the individual level of that, too, where, you know, I mean, this is a, a often commented discussion of you can only show your happy, glamorous, smiling face on this. I mean, Instagram, Instagram is a thunderdome of luxury consumption experiences out there, whether it's your meal or your vacation or something else. I can't even bear to look at Instagram anymore because just the stabbing, lingering je uh, uh, jealousy of, of fear of missing out just goes courses through it. And I, I'm sort of curious, I mean, where does this end up going? I mean, are we, are, we, are, are we in danger of reaching a point where we can no longer say I'm unhappy, where that is impermissible? We have now, you've like breached the reality field if you simply say you are sad. Like it's, you know, instead of, instead of acknowledging that perhaps sadness is a good thing, we're no longer allowed to say we are sad because now we are questioning the very tenets of neoliberal reality or something of those lines. I don't know if either of you have thoughts on this, but you know. Will, will be denied the unhappiness? Uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm sure there are cultures where that's true, and there are social media platforms where that's true. I've, I've seen it said that no one is as happy as they appear on Facebook, nor as angry as they appear on Twitter. Um, so there are different platforms for different things. And there are um, mood monitoring apps, which are specifically for people to share uh, evidence of their unhappiness. So these things exist. I mean, there are, I, I've, I've been doing interviews with, with some of the companies that... that or, App, app designers that build these things like Mood Panda, Got a Feeling, these various apps which are basically ways of sharing an emotion with someone else. And, and it was recently in the British news that emoji, if that's how you say, is the fastest growing language in, in Britain right now. Um, and so I think there's something very interesting going on as a result of the rise of social media and the digital economy that, that, that emotions are becoming sort of um, these sort of entities that can be sort of passed around so I've got this feeling it's a it's an objective I can give an objective score to the feeling or an objective description of the feeling and then I can basically share it with someone else uh, and that this is becoming the sort of um, the lingua franca of social media and of the internet now one of the things which interests me in the book is how is it even that we came to view something like an emotion as something which we can speak about in this kind of factual, objective way, uh, which in a way there's something very philosophically problematic about that, because emotions aren't really facts in the way that your body temperature is a fact. I mean, I can, I can find out, a doctor can find out whether or not someone has a high temperature, even if they've never had a high temperature themselves, they have the instruments to do it. Whereas, how would you know what the word happiness meant if you'd never experienced it yourself? So there are kind of philosophical problems with this uh, application of scientific language to the realm of feeling, the realm of the mind, the realm of emotions, uh, which I would argue in the book, this draws philosophically on Wittgenstein, that there is elements of psychological language which are completely unlike other forms of language. This idea that we can just speak about our minds, speak about our happiness in the same way that we can speak about, for instance, high blood pressure, is a philosophical mistake. And that's really what uh, I, I, I try to I use to try and interrogate and criticise what has become an obsession with emotions, things like market research, and that's a very... I, I would add, too, that... Uh one of the things that I think Will does so well in the book is show us how happiness has become a status symbol, right? So happiness is not a, not just something that you feel yourself, and then you or you feel with others. You know, might arguably say this, the origins of happiness having to do with connecting to other people, but now it's something that you use competitively, like everything else, right? So now it's it's I mean it's it's measured, it's ranked as as Will said. You can objectify, you can rank it on a scale of one to ten. But you can't, you know, talking about your feelings is now some kind of weird status game, right? There are all those jokes about humble brags that people do on social media too, where it's like, okay, well, I, I want to talk about how happy I am, but I know it kind of sounds like bragging, so I'm going to, you know, sort of talk about how happy I am, or I'm going to throw in something that's a little bit sad and bring it back. But it, you know, it becomes this, it becomes a currency. Happiness becomes a currency that has a value, and the more you have of it, the more you seem to have gotten it all. I mean, when you describe going on Instagram and that feeling of sort of, Envy and 
you know, desire to be part of it, and yet you, know, you can't really look away, you have fear of missing out, and at the same time, when you get off Instagram, you don't really feel that happy. Right? It doesn't really make you feel that good about yourself. So it's, it's kind of nefarious that way. It isn't really happiness the way that I think it was imagined to be or something that we just really feel ourselves. No. Well, I love I love that uh, Will opens. We're going to open to questions in a second. I love that Will opens the book with an image of a French monk who has literally shattered the world record for happiness as they have measured it, and as they put it, his prize is to get invited to Davos. So it's sort of a booby prize for breaking the happiness record. Um, I'm sure you have many questions beyond what I can ask. Uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, would you like to start asking them now? We have about uh, 25 minutes left. I think um, I can keep going. Yes, please. Um, will you say that So this is, things like fMRI is at the absolute front line of the, the subjectification of emotions that is going on right now. I would argue that, of course, the capacity to monitor events in the brain has increased hugely. And this has created a lot of the current exuberance around emotions and around happiness in uh, business and in healthcare recently. But there are a couple of things that I think need to be recognize about this. The first is that often there's a mis misunderstanding of what fMRI can actually tell you or something like neuroscience because the fact that something is uh, facilitated by the brain or enabled by the brain or has some kind of neural uh, symptom doesn't necessarily mean that that's the same as, uh, as what you mean by happiness. Well, I mean, after all, when we use the word happiness, we don't mean a physiological event. We mean what we mean by it. So in some ways, they need to kind of come up with a different language mm -hmm. to, 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 for, for the neurosciences to, to refer to what they're referring to. Because often, I think this is where things tend to go wrong in areas like neuromarketing, there is a, a belief that neurological symptoms, neurological events can explain what's going on, whereas in fact they are simply uh, symptoms of something that is going on, but which still needs a kind of an interpretation and an understanding. Um, now, of course, you can measure symptoms, uh, just like you can measure the symptoms of someone who is, you know, says they are feeling pissed off with the world, or something like that, or says someone who says they are angry. Someone who's angry might go and hurl a brick at something else, but that doesn't mean that the symptom uh, can be measured as a way of understanding what it means to be an angry person. The symptom is something which uh, is visible to the object, to, to, to the watching eye, but in some ways, what, uh, as I argue in the book, what we're losing in our enthusiasm for all of this is the capacity to listen to people mm -hmm. and to listen to people what they say they are feeling and to articulate things in their own language uh, because we believe that physical symptoms, whether that be neural or some other kind of physiological symptom, uh, we're allowing them to become, uh, those indicators to become uh, uh, the, the extent of the story. And so I think clearly you can measure things. I'm not denying that you can measure things. People do measure things. The question is whether those measurements are adequate to understand what they, it is they're trying to measure. Other questions? Yeah, please. I have two quick questions. I haven't read the book yet, and I'm really looking forward to it. Could you give us a sort of just a brief overview of what the project is, how you started with it, what the what the book is doing? Right. I, I'll tell you how, how I came to write the book. So, um, around about 2008, 2009, as the financial crisis was uh, in its depths, I assumed, like many people, that we were about to watch uh, a fundamental shift in the political economy of the West. Lots of people thought this at the time. I remember the BBC's business editor said, this is gonna do for Western capitalism what 1989 did for communism. This is, this is it, this is the big one that, that, that many Marxists have been waiting for. Um, and, uh, for better or worse. Um, and, and then within about a year, I was sort of very interested in how this event was being uh, explained by various economic experts. And to my astonishment, people, rather than focusing on things like regulation or the state or markets or structures or sociological categories or even economic categories, people were increasingly saying, well, there are these cognitive biases and, and heuristics that go on in Wall Street 
and the brain releases the wrong kind of mix of neurochemicals at the wrong time, or there are things like evolutionary psychology suddenly got a, a, a very good hearing around about this time. Uh, and the actually markets still work absolutely fine, but that sometimes human beings have these kind of cognitive, psychological, neural um, errors that uh, need to be understood, and they need to be understood through experiments, through neurosciences, through uh, possibly through interviews or whatever it might be. Um, and so that's what drew me into being very interested in economic psychology, because in some ways it's through the fusion of economics and psychology as separate disciplines, traditionally separate disciplines, that current crises of capitalism are being coped with. So the crisis of productivity in the workplace is dealt with not through asking fundamental questions about the nature of work or the nature of the distribution of power or status in, in, in business or in society, but through greater attempts to try and uh, monitor and manage well-being and feelings of optimism at work or commitment at work. Equally, these uh, questions of decision-making in markets, which is how the whole rise of many of you will have heard the notion of nudge behavioral economics, is uh, achieving huge amounts of policy influence at the moment because it's assumed that the broad structures of markets and of the distribution of power in society and of regulation uh, must be fundamentally correct. Therefore, we need to go into the mind and into the brain to find out how mistakes get made and how uh, uh, such undesirable outcomes are still possible. So that's how it came about. And I think there is a longer history which, through Bentham, through the early neoclassical economics of the late 19th century, to try and understand... Why would we even think that the mind operates according to particular kind of economic or statistical rules in the first place? Um, and in some ways, what I've discovered as a result of writing the book is many people who've got in touch with me most enthusiastically have actually been psychoanalysts. Because it's psychoanalysts who feel often most threatened by a lot of the agenda that I criticise. They feel that they're losing clients, they're losing funding, they are losing credibility, they've been losing credibility in the psychiatry world since the 1960s, really. Um, but the idea that the mind is fundamentally physiological and f fundamentally economic in nature, that it, that it is calculative, that it, uh, uh, that, it, that it behaves much like any other organ in the body, like the liver or any other organ, is something that is a ter tremendous threat to psychoanalysis. Uh, and I think what, in some ways, I've enjoyed discovering new areas of psychoanalysis since writing and reading, uh, since writing the book, of of the I suppose the romanticism of the mind really, uh, and the sense that human beings uh, are disorderly, uh, and even if they don't necessarily feel rebellious, fundamentally they have a rebellious streak that they may not even understand themselves. That I think is something which is uh, retained serious critical purchase upon behaviorism and positivist approaches to the mind. Second question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it sort of attaches to this because one of the, the beautiful things about this moment is that you're sitting in this bookstore with those books behind you. Tony Morrison, a, a Diga is over here, right? So I think a little bit about what Melissa was saying about how sadness functions in a culture as well as a motive for creating art and telling stories. And it strikes me that poets and novelists are actually doing uh, quite a bit of high end research, if you will. Uh, naming the particulars of a range of emotions that corporate capitalism will never get their hands on, right? Of course, they may never make bank, right? Some of the, the best poets I know are doing a, a kind of work of naming the particulars of happiness that, that defy any sort of categorization. So uh, that's not a question, it's just a statement of fact, like how awesome this is. And I guess the question that comes out of it then is, um, when you when you were doing the research for the book, um, do you, are you talking to individual people who are involved in this industry? Because when Melissa, for instance, when we're talking about advertising doing X or advertising doing Y, it sort of like anthropomorphizes the industry. So I'm wondering if like if you guys approach this by by talking to individual people inside the, the industry who are making these choices, because that seems to attach to the social construction of emotion. I can talk a little bit about that too, or yeah. specific individuals. So, all right, so in this case, so uh, regarding sort of the sensor analysis that's being done here and the instrumentation of what's going on. So, um, so yeah, so literally last month at Fast Company, uh, there were 20 of us who wore sensor badges, sociometric badges. And Will goes into the book into a discussion of socio sociometry, sociometry? I don't know, sociometrics as a field. And so this badge, this badge that we wore, 20 of us, 
it, uh, we wore it every day around our necks. It had an infrared sensor, it had Bluetooth, it had an accelerometer so it knew where we went, and it also listened to everything we said, although not for content, just how we talked to each other, so what turns we took, our vocal intonations. Mm -hmm. And in theory, you know, you could use all of this to basically build, you know, uh, elaborate discussions of emotion and timber and things like that. It's mostly used to figure out who you are actually talking to and, and how it's actually used. And so to me, it's interesting, you know, the notion of individuals. So I know the CEO of this company, he comes out of the MIT Media Lab, which is its own sort of school of thought on this. So the, 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 the founder of this company or the patron saint of this, Alexander Sandy Pentland at MIT, who has what he calls honest signals, which is exactly what sort of Will's talking about, the notion of that there are sub-level, subconscious level uh, signals we give off which are actually more telling as to our behavior than what we really consciously say. And he actually believes that you can aggregate this at a very large scale and you could basically do like psychohistory out of Isaac Asimov out of sci-fi. Um, but the founder of the company is a guy named Ben Weber who's younger and, and, uh, and smart. And you know, and what he believes in the so sort of Will's project about engagement and things like this is, is that he believes that most of the sensor technology and used for this sort of thing has gone horribly wrong. That we use it to basically work people into the ground, to mine efficiency out of them and leave them broken. And so he believes, and I would like to believe he's true, um, that we can that we basically when you're stuck in a corporate America that only believes you can manage what you measure, is that you can use this sort of technology, you can use this sort of data exhaust off of this to finally make the cases for more humane arrangements of offices and more humane working arrangements because now you go to managers and say, hey, if you put the office this way with more daylighting and these sorts of things, we now have actual absolute measures that say this is better. If you give people more autonomy, if you give people you know, more time off, you can actually lead to better output, you know, it actually become more productive. Um, he believes that you can actually make this case. And to me, the interesting question we discussed this earlier is, is you know, there's a, you can tell people a lot of things uh, but often they don't want to hear it. And so I'm very curious about whether, rationally speaking, that you can use this to argue that people will be happier if you give them more autonomy, or will it simply be ignored in favor of the current order of things? I mean, this gets the notion of, like, can these, can these technologies be used for good, good, broadly speaking, or will the system make them evil eventually? Are they poisoned at the root? And it's interesting, Will, in his discussions of the roots of, of sociometrics, sort of suggested to me that they were more poisoned at the root than I had thought. But so, I, I, mean, I think... One thing which I try to stress in the book is uh, the question of intentions is not necessarily all that significant. I mean, I, you could have a society which was perfectly administered towards promoting the maximum good of, the ma of, of most people. This is what Jeremy Bentham imagined in the late 18th century. So this is what an enlightened society would look like. But still there would be a problem with that kind of society. And I think the problem with that kind of society would be, and I think this comes back to, to some of the sort of examples that, that you're talking about, Greg, is that human beings in that sort of society lose the authority to explain and narrate their own lives. Because what arises is that others, experts, or it might be machines, become more knowledgeable about our feelings and about what is likely to improve those feelings than we do. And this is what, you know, this is... I just, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it is, I'm not denying the empirical reality that sometimes we make bad decisions. And this is what a lot of behavioral economics uh, trades on is the idea that there's a happiness economist in Britain called Paul Dolan who uh, you know, has, got, has moved from happiness economics into self help because he knows from the data what will make you happy. And he knows that you're going to take bad decisions. So read his book and you won't make those decisions anymore and, and so on. But I think the, 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 the problem is as a lot of this agenda becomes more and more about bodily symptoms and less and less about what psychologists will call reports is that our voices are being progressively shut out altogether we don't not not to silence us in some sort of conspiracy but just because you don't need to actually speak to someone any longer to find out how they're feeling or to find out what they want. I mean, one of the frontiers of behavioural economics, Cass Sunstein, one of the authors of Nudge, uh, is now interested, I'm not saying he's a kind of promoting it or, or, or trying to kind of make money out of it or anything, but has been writing about what he calls predictive shopping, which is the idea that, um, that goods could just arrive in your house uh, without you having selected them, because it can be divined for, via data analytics what, what you want. Now, of course, we don't have to sign up for this. I'm not suggesting that this is 
a sort of, you know, something which is going to be forced on us. But I think what's so telling about that example is that in some ways it's consumerism going full circle and eating its own tail, where the ultimate end of a sort of hyper-consumer society is one where consumers stop even bothering to go to the effort of saying, I want that, and it sort of just arrives. So that, I think, is the, is the risk here, is that a perfectly administered society, even a well-intentioned one, is one which, in some ways, is a society of silence. As that, 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 that's how I kind of imagine the perfect happy society, is one where no one ever has to say anything. Let alone dissent. <laughs> no, no, which, of course, is another problem. Other questions? Yeah, please. Well, well, um, you, you first, sorry. You already had one. Please go ahead. We'll come back to you in a second. I'm in part connected to what you were just saying, just thinking about the sort of normative values of happiness and how it can be assimilated in different ways. And I'm really curious about what you might have to say about the, the cultural power plays of defining happiness um, and how happiness can sometimes be connected to the valuing of certain bodies and certain lives over others. And I'm thinking, I mean, as a very basic example, if somebody comes out to their parents and it's like, oh, well, I just want you to be happy. Well, what the fuck do you mean by that? <laughs> right? And what, what is it that you're actually veiling when you say that? And so what, what kinds of cultural power plays happen there? I'm curious if, if you have anything to say about yeah. that, like how it can veil sexism and homophobia and racism and yeah. in terms of what is given the value of happiness, which is, oh, well, you can't, you can't, I just want it to be happy. Yeah, well, I mean, in that particular instance, it's very interesting question about what does the parent mean when they say that do they do they really mean i i just want not to have to worry about you being happy which is sort of you know probably a lot of, of what that means um uh and uh, but i think there are all sorts of normative assumptions in the the science of happiness so i mean when the parent says i just want you to be happy they're not they're not making a uh uh, an empirical state, they don't make a scientific statement or a scientific prediction or anything. Um, but within the, the science, there is all sorts of, um, you know, the types of questions that get asked in surveys obviously are, are very loaded in all sorts of ways. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of questions about, the, about particular family models which uh, seem to uh, fascinate the, the survey people in happiness uh, studies um, and I think the issue is that you can't not impose cultural assumptions on these things there's a there's a, um, a quote which I think is Bertrand Russell who said that the he, reacting to the, the surge of psychoanalysis in the 1920s and 1930s he said being sarcastically that the, the problem with psychoanalysis is that British psychoanalysts think that the unconscious is a British person. Austrian psychoanalysts think that the unconscious is an Austrian. French psychoanalysts think that the unconscious is an Austrian. The same is true with the brain. So neuromarketers think that the brain is endlessly wanting to buy things. Neuroeconomists think that the brain is endlessly calculating things. Ne social neuroscience, which is what people like Matt Lieberman and John Cacioppo and people do, thinks that the brain is endlessly trying to strike up relationships. So there's this sort of... Yeah. So we impose onto the brain the presuppositions of our theoretical and normative and uh, philosophical assumptions. Now, and I'm sure, I don't really address what you're specifically talking about in your book, I'm sorry, in, my, I don't, what you're, in your question, in the, I don't address it in the book, but I've no doubt that you could pursue a very important and interesting critique along the lines that you're, you're, you're suggesting uh, by looking at some of the quite conservative uh, presuppositions that, that get smuggled into a lot of the happiness statistics and economics. I mean, you know, because so much of it does seem to be about um, nuclear families acting in certain ways and, you know, divorce is bad for happiness and so on. But, I mean, of course, you know, I mean, that, that poses more questions than it answers. Do you have a question? Yeah, please go ahead and then we'll go to the back. So you're talking about um, self-report and seeming to um, want that. And so I have two questions. One is, uh, what is the context that you want people to be talking about with their friends and family, or like to um, census takers mm. to get actual kind of measures of happiness that are based mm. on self-report? I didn't use the term self-report. I mean, I think one of the the notion of self-report is 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 in some ways flawed from from the perspective I'm taking anyway, because it suggests that there's a kind of objective entity somewhere lying within me, which if only I can just sort of come up with the right number, I can just sort of communicate it to the survey, and then my happiness has been sort of registered somewhere. What I argue in the book is 
one of the problems with living in a society which turns happiness and unhappiness into quasi-medical problems is that you're, you cease to speak, speak out about what makes you unhappy to the person or to the institution that has made you unhappy. What I'm asking for, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is not more self-reporting you know, in, a, in a kind of methodological sense, it's more institutions which would give people the voice to m explain, narrate, uh, and communicate their unhappiness in the context where the unhappiness actually arises. If you're unhappy at work, speak about your unhappiness at work. Don't go to your doctor and speak about your unhappiness. Uh, if the context of your unhappiness, if what you seem to think makes you unhappy, is taking place somewhere else. And one of the problems is that once unhappiness and happiness become viewed as these objective things that kind of happen to us, uh, we cease to actually view them in their contexts, in their cultural locations, in their political locations, and it has a deeply depoliticizing uh, <coughs> effect because we're no longer doing, we're no longer making complaints. You know, I mean, I think making, making a complaint is a really important thing. I mean, I think, of course, there's the notion of sort of complaint to customer service, which becomes a more of a sort of, I'm just going to kind of, it becomes more like sort of feedback or something. But I think the capacity to say, you know, I don't like something, not in the sense of sort of, you know, Facebook unliking, but in a, in a sort of sense of like, I have a problem with this. In a way, it's that capacity to turn unhappiness into a political tool or into something that can affect change in the world that uh, is undermined by viewing happiness and unhappiness as, as scientific or objective phenomena. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, I, I'm a little bit confused by that because I feel like people complain all the time. And I hear that they are very uncomfortable in some way, um, and they are really convinced that it's because of the incredibly unreasonable behavior of X or whoever, um, and you are like, I don't know, if I was in that situation, I don't really think I'd be that happy about that. Like, <laughs> yeah. Your unhappiness in this case, or your whatever, discomfort, is more about what's going Something on with you. Right rather than like just the situation. And I mean I think that kind of bears out on the fact that like identical situations happen to people all the time and as a rule we respond to them emotionally in totally different ways. Yeah. So it's like there has to be it's not as though there are bad things and that we should just, you know, fix by complaining about. Mm -hmm. It's like there are things and then there are emotions. And like, I'm not denying that I'm not denying that the that, that emotion that the human beings are emotional or irrational or that or that they that they misunderstand their their lives and that they mis narrate their lives. What I'm criticizing are the excesses of a of a worldview that says that that there are facts and actually all of that confusion and all of that misunderstanding and all the things which ultimately yeah if you're your friend you 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 go through it with them you you know you you wouldn't want that conversation between two friends about unhappiness to be settled with a set of facts if someone came in and said oh by the way like look at this actually you're wrong about that you're right about that you're wrong about that now you could just stop the conversation is that actually a type of would that be a, uh, something which would make for better friendships or make for a better society uh, so um, in friendship, well, no. Okay. But, well, well, hold on. One but, second. Sorry, we're running out of time. So what are we going to well, do? Like, I was just thinking that um, the reason why we don't complain to our boss, for instance, is because we get fired. Like, there's not a way. There are not like people react badly to complaints. So we find ways to like shove it down and like complain to our friends and go to our doctors only because other people, as a rule, do not like hearing that you want something to be different. All right. We'll, we'll go back. I want to get to the back here. So, um, yeah, question. Go ahead. So one thing I'm curious about, I've spoken with a lot of folks who have different definitions of what happiness and unhappiness are in my life of work. And I'm curious, while you were researching your book, what the most surprising fact you came across was? The, the most surprising fact? You got it. More anecdotes? What, from happiness researchers? 
just in terms, that's correct, in terms of how people actually define happiness or unhappiness. Um, the most surprising one. Um, I mean... You weren't shocked by any of them. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, there sh I'm shocked by some of the manipulative uses of some of it, but there wasn't, um, I mean, I, what surprises me as much as anything is how uh, the sort of, how, how, how almost utopian some of the science is in the, in the idea that, that, that it's possible to move from claims about human flourishing into measuring the amount of cortisol in the blood uh, without there being any kind of problem in that sort of transition from a sort of ethical discussion into a medical discussion and that the two can just be easily kind of conflated without without any problem and that that's something you encounter quite a lot in this in this in this world um i don't know if i have a have a a, a very good answer to your question I'll reflect on that do we still have any questions in the far back you had one yes i'm going to overlook you um at the, at the start, you said um, that yeah, we can all sign up to. We all want to be happy. That's something everybody wants. Um, but I'm just thinking maybe this is just pure like unbridled naivety. But you know, being a good person or doing the right thing, you know, looking after your horrible aunt in her old age, even though you don't like her and she makes you really unhappy. That's something that people do. Can I mean, is that? Do you think that's you know that's valid? And and can all these you know happiness scientists and those markers is and everyone, can they explain that? Can what they do capture those kinds of um, ideas and ways that people behave? I mean, uh, so there are social neuroscientists who claim that they can understand that. I mean, there are people like Matt Lieberman say that uh, when we see someone else in pain, it affects the same part of our brain as when we experience pain ourselves. So that sympathy is, in their terms, hardwired into us biologically. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are ways in which that can be integrated, but ultimately what you're talking about is uh, the essence of morality or, or some sense of duty, which uh, you know, moral philosophy would suggest that there is a fundamental tension between the sorts of activities you're describing and the worldview of happiness promotion, because one of the core problems all along with uh, the, 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 the utilitarian view of maximizing happiness is could you just abandon whole chunks of the population and would that actually be best overall? Uh, and I think when you look at how the well-being agenda works within companies, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it can work, is that there are people whose wellness and happiness doesn't matter to the bottom line and it's not clear how they fit into some sort of corporate wellness and happiness programs. But. Yeah, I would say there's a question here. I just want to add on to that quickly, but that one, um, for those of you who follow Zappos, the shoe retailer, they're in the midst of this crazy corporate cult re-engineering experiment called Holacracy, and they famously pay people to leave if they're a bad cultural fit. So they just literally paid 20% of the company to quit. Right. And a very conscious attempt to basically say, we're going to get rid of the malcontents, and those of us who are staying, you're either with us or you're leaving. And so and so it's exactly that kind of engineering, like we'll just shed 20% in a, you know the humane way of taking severance. But but yeah, please, you had a question. You were waiting. So the question I was was whether or not you saw this as being targeted to men and women differently. And what I'm thinking about in particular here is um, the book The Happiness Project, which is disgusting, um, but also um, <laughs> Barbara Ehrenreich's book, Right Sided, and she talks about like, the breast cancer and how she was supposed to be happy throughout this whole process, right? And putting pink ribbons on it and all that other kinds of things. So I was just wondering what the difference was between targeting happiness towards men versus uh, women. Yeah, it's very interesting. And, and Barbara Ehrenreich's book is, is superb on, on all of this. Um, um, I'm just trying to think. Because I, I'm, I guess what I'm mainly concerned with in the book is, is the metrics and the economics and the science rather than the, the, the kind of self-help and the positivity agenda, which someone like Ehrenreich uh, criticizes brilliantly. Um, so this question of sort of, you know, how does this turn into a, a set of tips for how to live? Um, uh, yeah, I'm sure it does have very, very different uh, outcomes. I don't. Listen, do you know? If, do you have any thoughts on this? Because I, I didn't, I didn't really come across that because so much of what I was looking at was the sort of, um, as I say, the kind of attempt to create these sort of metrics, these sort of to to, to cre basically to identify what could be considered a sort of generalized notion of happiness. Mm -hmm. 
whether it be in the case of Bentham or the discovery or the invention of the notion of stress in the 1930s and 1940s, the idea that there could be a single thing that, that all of us are basically motivated by or, 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 or sort of um, drives us one way or the other. Um, and of course, in that, it is blind to culture, or seems to be blind to culture, to gender, and so on. The people who've driven it have tended to be men at every single point. I mean, I, I, I discussed probably about 10 or 12 different characters in the book, key people who have, who have developed this agenda, and now when I think about it, uh, I think it's 12 men. So, um, <laughs> um, so uh, I'm sure there's a, there's a yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I would just add to that by saying that it's one of the interesting things that you bring up in the book that I've noticed also in my own work on branding is how, how it's so important to promote this as neutral, mm. right? And, and some of these questions have really pointed to that problem that as soon as you start talking about issues like the, about duty or issues of diversity uh, or issues of cultural specificity, they don't, they don't fit into these models. And, you know, the example that you give, Greg, of Zappos, you know, well, that's such a... It's so it's so weird how they managed to turn this idea of happiness on De its head. Delivering, it's not really delivering happiness is Tony yeah, Shea's book. Yes, right, yes. but it's really not about happiness. What it strikes me is it's about is a, is a drive for control and a way to manage anxiety and fear. That is really what comes to mind for me. And so all of the so I could imagine that women and men would react very differently to some of the metrics that have been brought up, but the fact that they react differently doesn't really fit the agenda. So you can't admit the difference. And with branding, it was exactly the same thing. When you're talking about nation branding, for instance, it was like, OK, what this particular country, uh, let's take Uganda. OK, Uganda wants to be a happy country. What will it take? That's not really the question that they're asking. What they're asking is, how can we brand Uganda so that other people in the world see it as a safe place to do business? That's really what they're actually saying. And I feel like with this happiness stuff, it's kind of the same story. It's really like, let's create safe spaces in which to conduct market exchange, in which to make money, right? In, in which to continue profiting in some way. And all of the elements that don't really fit that model of happiness, which is a very particular model that doesn't connect to so many of the examples that you've all brought up, have to be excised, have to be marginalized. Yeah, I was just, I was just thinking that uh, earlier during one of these conversations is is how would how would the happiness industrial complex deal with Black Lives Matter in the sense of of, of a sense of, of anger rooted in injustice institutional injustice like yeah. it simply cannot handle that other than basically dose them with enough antidepressants until yeah. you're stupid. Well, I think that that demonstrates that sometimes ha unhappiness is something people uh, it's core to their identity. I mean, like what, one of the uh, examples I think of in, in Britain is is. Um, the uh, what's called the um, the Hillsborough disaster from 1989, where uh, 96 football fans died and the police tried to cover up how they died, and the people of Liverpool clung to a sense of unhappiness about that for 25 years before it was fully acknowledged what the problem was. So you need to cling on to unhappiness, mm -hmm. otherwise the whole notion of redress for injustice doesn't make any sense. So in that kind of instance. Uh, Unhappiness can be identity forming and it can be a source of hope as well. That's ultimately the, the, the paradox of all of this is that if you can't recognize the value of unhappiness as a source of identity, you can't have hope for right. unhappiness then coming to some kind of resolution in the future. Well, I promised we'd end with unhappiness. So, so yeah, so thank you all for coming. Wave a hand. I know we're a little bit over. Thank you all so much. Now we'll continue this uh, uh, discussion over drinks, the original uh, uh, compensation for unhappiness. <laughs>